hearing the Parliament Channel 11. Also broadcasting on 105.5. Good morning, and let me on behalf of the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee warmly welcome officials from the Ministry of Finance, Investments Division, the Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprise Development, the National Entrepreneurship Development Company Limited, NETCO, members of the media, and of course, members of the public. May I also indicate from the very outset that the meeting that we are having at this time is being held in public and is being broadcast on the Parliament's channel, channel 11 and Radio 105.5 FM, as well as the Parliament's YouTube channel, Pal View. The purpose of this meeting of the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee is to examine the audited accounts, balance sheet, and other financial statements of the National Entrepreneurship Development Company Limited, NETCO, for the period 2008 to 2014. Our committee is desirous of hearing the challenges faced or being faced by the key stakeholders at NETCO in an attempt to determine some of the possible solutions to these challenges. The role of our committee is to help NETCO improve its delivery of services in an efficient, effective, and economic manner. May I repeat, the, the role of our committee, the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee, is to help NETCO improve its delivery of services in an efficient, effective, and economic manner. I will now ask officials from the Ministry of Finance, invest. Yeah, before I ask, thank you. Before I ask officials, from the Ministry of Finance to introduce themselves. May I take this opportunity to ask members of the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee to introduce themselves, and then we will go to the officials from the Ministry of Finance and officials from the Ministry of Labor, Small Enterprise Development. May I ask my colleague to introduce himself? Thank you, Chairman. Good morning to our members of the committee and our visiting team from NETCO Ministry of Finance, Foster Cummings Number. 
Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Jennifer Bitti Freimuth, member of this committee. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Kerry Ann Kitsia Coburn, member. Good morning, everyone. I'm David Small, member of the committee. Um, good morning again to everyone. My name is Wade Mark, and I'm chairman of the committee. Once again, welcome. May I now call on officials from the Ministry of Finance to introduce themselves. Good morning, everyone. My name is Junior Dwari, business analyst. Good morning, everyone. My name is Aidan Manzano, executive director in the investment division, CFM. Good morning, my name is Suresh Dan, Senior Business Analyst, Ministry of Finance Investment Division. Good morning, everyone. Natalie Willis, Acting Permanent Secretary. Good morning, Michael Gordon, Manager, Enterprise Development Division. Good morning, Chair, members of the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee. I am Shanti Singh Ming Sang, Acting Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprises. Netco, National Entrepreneurship Development Company Limited, to introduce themselves. Good morning, everyone. Barry Ben, Chairman of the Board of Directors of Netco. Good morning, everyone. Willa Guy Straker, Director on the Board of Netco. Good morning, everyone. Albert Chow, Chief Executive Officer. Good morning, everyone. Curtis Mears, Corporate Business Analyst, Netco. Good morning, all. Zalisa Emanuel, Finance Manager. Good morning, everyone. Lydia Bihaila, Good morning to all. Lily Indar Singh, Corporate Secretary Netco. Good morning, everyone. Marion Rouse, Human Resource and Administration Manager, Netco. Well, once again, thank you and welcome once again. May I at this time invite the distinguished chairman of NETCO to make some brief opening remarks at this time. Mr. Clary Ben. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. In August 2002, the National Entrepreneurship Development Company Limited, NETCO, was established by the government of Trinidad and Tobago as a state-owned limited liability company to provide microfinance services to assist in the development of a sustainable small and micro enterprises sector. The key stakeholders are the government of Trinidad and Tobago through the line ministry, the board of directors, the clients, management, and staff. Cabinet minute number 776 of April 2002 governs the establishment of NEDCO to be the implementing agency for government's policy on small and micro enterprise development. In 2005, NEDCO established the Entrepreneurial Training Institute and Incubation Center, ETIC, as a strategic business unit. And in 2011, NEDCO launched the National Integrated Business Incubator System, IBIS, a program initiated by the Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprise Development specifically for intense monitoring of entrepreneurs and early stage businesses, including startups. NEDCO's business model, therefore, consists of an integrated system of key services designed to cover the critical support needs for the developing entrepreneurs. On assuming office in December 2015, 
the Board of Directors of NEDCO was advised by the Line Minister of Labor and Small Enterprise Development of a new mandate for NEDCO. Among the items listed are the following. One, the provision of financing to small businesses, including but not limited to term loans, equity and quasi-equity financing, and working capital financing. Two, the provision of training via short courses and business advisory services to small business clients. Three, the development of policies and strategies that aid in the development of small enterprises. And four, the coordination of all entrepreneurship development programs receiving government support. It is against this background that the new board on assuming office uh, very proactively engaged the services of Price Waterhouse Coopers, PwC, to undertake a comprehensive review of the operations of NEDCO. Among the findings of PwC were, one, in its current form, the business is not sustainable and largely dependent on government support to meet operating costs. Two, the existing mandate of NEDCO is not being fulfilled, and in some instances, it is unclear. Three, there is a critical need to revisit the business model and the financial viability of NEDCO, particularly in the context of the new mandate. Four, the current financial state of NEDCO is not sustainable, and rapid action must be taken to transform the business model. And five, given the scope of the new mandate, a robust plan of effective stakeholder management is needed for implementation of the new mandate. The foregoing underscores the current status of NEDCO, which can be aptly described as an institution at its crossroads. The current board is very conscious of the state of affairs of NEDCO and is committed to embarking on a sea change at the organization, which would involve a thorough transformation of the institution geared toward creating a sustainable, self-reliant, process-driven, socio-economic-oriented, lean, entrepreneurial development institution. This will be consistent with and is deemed a prerequisite for the successful execution of the new mandate the government has outlined for NEDCO. As we appear before this committee today, Mr. Chairman, it will be fair to say that NEDCO is in transition. The very composition of our team reflects just that. On my left is Mr. Alwa Chow, who assumed duties as CEO of NEDCO on September 18th, 2017, less than two months ago. We at the level of the board see the quality of leadership and the management at the management level as a critical component of the transformation process. And it is here that we are making our start. The board of directors is convinced that NEDCO is in urgent need of strong and visionary leadership at the level of management at this time. If the revised mandate given to it by the Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprise Development is to be accomplished. In fact, the report of the committee appointed to review and assess wholly owned state enterprises indicated in its report on NEDCO as follows, and I quote, NEDCO has not been well managed since its establishment, as evidenced by a 77% non-performing loan ratio and an accumulated deficit of almost $150 million, unquote. The current board underscores its commitment to ensuring that the dream of NEDCO by its founding fathers will be restored, and it will once more be seen as a vehicle for spreading the philosophy and the attributes of entrepreneurship among all segments of the national community so that a new breed of confident Trinbigonians 
with the enlightened spirit of self-determination and innovative pursuits can emerge in Trinidad and Tobago. In closing, Mr. Chairman, let me say that we have observed that the period identified for review is the period 2008 to 2014, a period which would have preceded this board. This notwithstanding, our team will seek to provide the responses to you and your members as forthright as we possibly can. I thank you. Well, may I thank you for your very um, frank and sincere and straightforward opening comments and remarks on NETCO. And I'm also conscious of the fact that your board was only appointed um, a couple, maybe just under two years. And therefore, you would not have been at the helm during the period on the review. And we are very happy that you would be able to address as best as you can some of the concerns that we have. The first thing I'd like to ask is this. Can you make a copy of that very comprehensive report that you made mention of, which was commissioned by NETCO and which was executed by, by Price Waterhouse Cooper? The other area that caught my attention when you were making your opening remarks had to do with what you describe as, I don't know if I got the figure right, but is it 77% of non-performing loans at the level of net co? And would you share with this committee this 77% non-performing loans between the period 2008 um, to 2014. Um, have you been able to determine since your stewardship a significant reduction in that portfolio responsibility or is it still occurring as you, as you said remain in this state of transition as you seek to improve the quality of management and leadership at the helm of NETCO. Would you want to share with us what is the situation now? And secondly, what can be done or what is being done to recover the value of the 70% non-performing loans. And if you could share with us, if it missed me, what is the value in dollars and cents of the 70% non-performing loans that you have on your books at this time? Jay, you could just press for us. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Not used to this. Um, yes. Um, Clearly, the obvious question would be, how have we gotten there to this point? And uh, as I've alluded, it was essentially the quality of management during the period. Um, because the quality of management, in the end, would have had to oversee all the systems, the extent to which the systems are tight enough and uh, contribute to that level of delinquency. And it would be fair to say, and um, yes, as, and you would see it in the report when you get a copy of it, that the systems were rather weak. The 
systems that the organization had in place were rather weak in terms of their risk management, in terms of the measures used to improve and enhance the quality of management of risk in particular. Um, but it would be fair to say, notwithstanding that, we over the past few years have seen an improvement in that. In other words, it is no longer at that level of 70 odd percent, but it is now nearer 20 percent. And this is in recognition of the fact that, as one would imagine, that we, our clientele, essentially would be that group of persons that would have or tend to have very high risk profile in that sense. Um, so one would know that the funds granted to them via loans would be at, I would say, above normal level of risk, largely because of the sector in which you have your area of specialization. But that notwithstanding, we also believe that the, during the early days in particular, the messages that were sent from NEDCO to its clientele may not have been appropriate. In other words, the persons who would have come to NEDCO and received loans may have interpreted those loans as grant financing. And the mere fact that this was being administered by a government agency, the sentiment was that there is no need to repay these loans. In fact, since we have come on board, um, well, what has happened in the interim is that we have an external collecting agency that has been going after these people. And as the heat is being turned on, because it will impair their credit rating as they go to other financial institutions for financial accommodation, they would want to clean their tracks. So, I, in particular, have been meeting with some of them going from loans going way back, and they're saying to me, you know, when we got this facility, we never knew that we had to repay this. And that would have contributed, in my humble view, significantly to the level. So what we see now is that within more recent times, as appropriate systems have been introduced and put into practice in terms of the coverage of these new facilities, there has been a major reduction in the level of delinquency. I don't know if I... Thank you. I just wanted to ask um, if you could share with us what was the value of in dollars and cents of the 70% delinquency rate that you made reference to? It would have been just in the vicinity of $94 million. About $94 million? $94 million. And could you tell us how many candidates would have been the involved? Numbers, how many candidates, accounts, how yeah. many accounts would have been involved here? We have a figure here of approximately 4,000. 4,000 accounts? Accounts, yes. And, and could you tell us, given the aggressive approach that your board and new management would have taken to address this gap between what you would have loaned and what you actually received, um, could you tell us how much you would have recovered Recovery. thus far, ah. and how many accounts would have been closed as a result of settlement out of the 4,000 accounts 
that you just mentioned. We probably don't have the exact figure of the number of accounts closed. What I can tell you is that re the recovery figure per month runs in the vicinity of $1.5 million. I think um, Senator Small would like to raise a point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the opportunity to join in. Again, once again, I'd like to welcome all members from the NEPCO who are here. So, Chairman, if you'd permit me, I want to be able to, to state my frame for how I'm going to approach my, my question in this morning. Mr. Chairman, I believe I'm a firm supporter that I, I accept that having a, a vibrant, small and, and medium-sized business sector in the country is vital to our sustained economic growth going forward. So let me, let, me, let me put my position on the record on that very clearly. I support it. The, the challenge we have in Trinidad and Tobago is that the system that we've tried to use is broken. And I, and I, want, to, I want to commend the chairman for being brutal with, with, with the facts of the status of NETCO. NETCO is broken. And I'm not sure, I, I think it's broken to the point where it needs to be completely overhauled. That is my opinion. Mr. Chairman, if you permit me now, in the, in the opening statement by the chairman of NETCO, he referred to a number that the accumulated losses were about 150 million. Well, I only have, we only have up to 2014 accounts, so my number is about 230 million. So, so I, I, that's, a, that's another issue because the, the parliament, we, we have accounts outstanding from NETCO, and, and there, there's some anomalies in there. But this, when you look at the performance of NETCO, and this is before your time, you have a situation where the, the entity its cost of operations for 100 persons is way out there. Netco is averaging $30 million cost of operations annually for 100 staff. Something is wrong there. And I, I would always be the first to say I don't advocate that people should lose their jobs. But we are in a situation where I think everyone understands the economic situation of the country is drastically adjusted in a negative direction. So we should be seeking value for money, efficiency, prudency, and then even in all of that, we need accountability. We need accountability. So I, I have my first question, really, because I just wanted to get those things out about how I wanted to understand, how does NETCO measure its performance? Because I sit here, and I, 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 I always, there's a saying, I think, if you can't, what gets measured gets done. So if you can't, what measures inside of NETCO, would NETCO use to say how we have performed? Do you have a scorecard? How, how, do, how does NETCO currently or in the past, whatever information you have, how does NETCO measure to say that we perform? I've looked at some of your annual reports. They, they look interesting, they sound wonderful, and it sounds as if they're doing good. But the numbers tell a, a complete opposite story. So I want to get from NETCO, how do you measure your performance? Honorable member, <laughs> I would have asked the same question as well. <laughs> because what I could tell you, what I could tell you is we are just about having just engaged, well, appointed a new CEO. And we are hoping that by the end of the first quarter of next year, we would have an entirely new senior management or executive team to support the CEO. This, the key performance <laughs> indicators, which is what I think you are asking, would be drastically changed. I could tell you what it will be. One would be the asset quality, the quality of your asset. Secondly, would be your level of efficiency. Thirdly, your level of productivity. And fourthly, your level of viability. Viability. And I firmly believe that if we use these measurements as the key performance indicators going forward, 
And, well, of course, you may or may not achieve what your targets may be, but at least they will stand as the benchmarks for your assessment. Um, we have had some difficulty, if you will, um, even knowing what is the state of play. And I'll tell you why. Because we have uh, well, a major product or project currently being undertaken at the level of NEDCO is the bringing into being of an integrated loan and account management platform. That we think is critical and essential going forward. Without it, as has happened in the past, the quality of data emerging would have been unreliable. We, and, and this, if I may say so myself, is a project that preceded us. In other words, when we assumed duties in 2015, that project was already ongoing. But the project was meandering without any clear sense of direction. And we think that we, we have taken that by the scruff of the neck, and we can comfortably say now that this project will go live in February of next year. So the quality of information, I'm saying in other words, if you do not have reliable data to quantify and to make an assessment of your performance through time, you know what I'm saying. So basically, I hear you. It would be difficult for me to sit here and say, well, these are the standards that were used in the assessment of the performance in the past. Even if they were, they will not be standards that I will feel comfortable with. Mr. Chairman, I have a follow-up. And Mr. 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 Ben, Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate your frankness. This is refreshing from where I sit because I look at the numbers, and the numbers that the previous operation of, of NETCO would scare any person. When you have revenue grant of, from the government of $17 million in 2011, but loan loss of $44 million, yes. mm -hmm. you can't, you, it, it's, it's not, you just can't, it just can't work. It can't work. So I, I, I appreciate that you've been able to lay out a roadmap for where you would like to be able to see how to measure. But here's my question, and I, I, I'm not putting you on the spot. But I, I, I appreciate your frankness so far. The team of people at NETCO now, do you think they will be able to step up their game or change their game? Because the, the team of people hasn't changed. The team that has delivered this, has, has delivered this, is a lot of them are still there. So I'm asking you for your, your view, in terms of the team who's there now, can they stay change their mental approach to be able to operate to deliver on the, in terms of the benchmarks that you've outlined. What is your opinion, Mr. Chairman? Yes, honorable member. Um, let me say that the team, much of the team, and you see, I will look at the leadership, the upper echelon at the place. Well, Mr. Cho is now on board and he's the senior person there is CEO. And there were other members of the executive team who fortunately, there is natural attrition. Mm -hmm. So their, their terms are just about being completed. Um, they were on contract actually, and they, they're departing the organization and their contracts which were not being renewed. So what is going forward, as I, as I said, the first quarter, we have, we will likely have a new executive at the top. Now, there are some hardworking people at the lower levels, but the guidance and direction and the motivation will tell you otherwise. 
And I think that will make a significant difference in moving forward. The difference at the top that can offer inspired leadership of the organization. We are confident at the level of the board will make a significant difference going forward. Mr. Chairman, I thank you. Mr. Chairman, will you permit me one final short little question before I allow order? I have, I have many questions, Mr. Chairman, so bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, a, I have a, a question for the finance manager. I have looked at, we only have up to 2014 accounts. And, this, and I'm, I'm seeing an anomaly in the accounts that I just don't understand. And I've seen it before with other state enterprises, but I, it, it's still, it is a accounting anomaly where you have all your revenues and all your expenditures equaling each other down to the cent, down to the penny. Whereas that, that, that is not, that suggests some other type of activity. And I would like to ask, how could it be down to the cent, all of the money you received, and then all of the money expended down to the cent, it balances to zero? Because that is, is, lack, that is an accounting impossibility in my respectful view. Okay, for your 2014 accounts. So that, I, I, I have asked this question before of another state entity and they had no reasonable answer. They gave me an answer in, in the corridor, but I, I won't repeat that. <laughs> Could someone help me here? Sorry, so, uh, sorry member. Um, at NEDCO and I guess at most state enterprises, it is deficient, deficit funding requirements that are used. Therefore, most times once the revenue grants are sufficient, to cover your expenditure, it's only that amount that is um, reflected in the income and expenditure. The excess then goes forward to be received the following year and optimal utilize, utilization of the grant. And I, I appreciate the response, that is the same response I got the last time, but it doesn't explain why in, in all the other years that didn't happen. So 2014 stands out because in the previous years, there, there's, either, uh, there's a net deficit. And in, in 2014, there's nothing. So that, oh, that's all I'm saying. It stands out. It, it, it's not like I accept what you're saying, that you get money in and you can only spend what the money you get in. And, but here's what. All the previous years on the, on the current review, there's, there's a net at the end. In 2014, it, it's, it's zero. So it, it shouldn't be zero unless somebody went in there, and, but let me stop there. Mr. Chairman, I, I am done with this round of questioning. I won't ask you to respond, Mr. Yeah? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I go back to your statement that there is need for strong and visionary leadership if NETCO is to survive. And I also note your response to the member here. But I have a concern. In 2014, NETCO spent approximately $1 million when they would have brought a consulting firm on board to do a restructuring exercise. And as a result of that exercise, we had five key positions being filled and those persons are, well, the, the response here says they are in permanent positions. And these positions include your chief operations officer, your executive manager, finance and risk, recoveries and procurement, which to me are key positions. How does this gel with your response just now, whereby natural attrition persons on contracts, some of those contracts may not be renewed? Because it suggests to me that some of these are also executive positions. So how would you speak to that situation? Thank you, Honorable Member. Um, the actual fact is that two of those that you've mentioned held executive positions on contracts on contract, which just came to, contracts which just came to an end during the course of this year. So could NETCO explain that having spent approximately $1 million with this consulting firm, how is it that persons were recruited who, it, for all accounts, seemed that they were not a good fit, they were not suitable for those positions? Could we, is, do you have an explanation for that? 
I will not have an expert. I will suggest when you get a copy of that document done by PwC, you will see the details there. <laughs> They're very graphic, you know. Um, and I think it is interesting reading because my own view is that while we will use their findings as a template for NETCO, I am reasonably sure the findings can be used as a template for other state organizations. I'm reasonably sure about that. Uh, so, yeah, I know. <laughs> Chairman, but, um, I, I realize you are stopping short of saying something. So I, I, I would, yes, so I'll protect you. I will leave you at that. You, in your opening statement, you yes. also indicated that NETCO has to have a new mandate if it is to survive. Could you explain what that new mandate is, if you have already identified it? Yes, I did in my opening remark, did identify some of the issues outlined in the new mandate. Um, for instance, and if I may just repeat some of them, the provision of financing to small businesses, including but not limited to term loans, equity and quasi-equity financing, and working capital financing. Then we had two, the provision of training via short courses and business advisory services to small business clients. Then we had three, the development of policies and strategies that aid in the development of small enterprises. And four, the coordination of all entrepreneurship development programs receiving government support. We have some other, if you will just permit me, um, I can find some of the other highlights. Uh, uh, the establishment of partnerships with public sector, private sector, and other non-governmental organizations in the development and implementation of small enterprise development programs. We have six, the development and implementation of market networks to support small enterprise development, including access to public procurement opportunities. And seven, the establishment of an advocacy system to ensure that there is action to proactively and reactively address the legitimate concerns of the small enterprise sector. Those are the seven planks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm heartened to hear that NETCO recognizes what needs to be done. But I also noted from the responses that were forwarded to this committee is that you have not completed your new strategic plan. How far are you with the strategic plan? Because I expect that strategic plan will guide all of these things and you know, provide the roadmap. So where are you with respect to your new strategic plan? Thank you, member. Uh, for the reasons that I would have indicated earlier, we are in transition. Uh, let me deal with it in a different way. We at the level of the board firmly believe that the development and the execution of a strategic plan is not really the work of the board. That we firmly believe is the work of the management. The management would be the ones to structure, put it together, and execute it and drive it. They, have, they must have buy into it. So, we could not have, prior to now perhaps, and over the next few months, even encouraged the preparation of a new strategic plan. Because it would have meant, for example, persons in the leadership of the preparation of that may no longer be with us. So what is happening now 
During this phase of transition, we have the CEO, and we will have the executive team coming forward who will be appointed, you know, you go out there, select appropriate people, and uh, they, with the rest of staff, will commence the structuring of the strategic plan. We anticipate that we should complete this exercise by the end of the first quarter of 2018. I may say so, and let me just say as well, that that PWC document will be used as a template for the preparation of that strategic plan going forward. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, may I ask of you to place in writing for this committee the um, outstanding accounts. Remember you mentioned earlier that you had recovered about 1.5 million. So if you could put in writing how many accounts that involve, and if you could anticipate and let us know what you expect in the immediate future and what amount could be written off because of the statute of limitation bar of four years. Um, it would be very interesting for our committee to know because remember as we go forward, given the robust managerial structure that you're gonna have in place, we expect this thing to reach maybe less than 5% in the future in terms of bad loans. So I wanted, I wanted to put that in writing for us. Also, we have seen in your submission that the financial audited accounts for 2015 and 2016 are supposed to be reaching us by December of 2017. Can you advise this committee if we are on target or whether we are not on target in receiving those reports so that we can begin going through those reports, re proper inquiries? Could you advise us as to where are we and where you expect us to be by December of 2017? Read those two reports. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I think we are on course, and we are on course to delivering those. I think we are just at this stage now, and I think it would be fair to say, do we have a date on it? In fact, in fact, Mr. Chairman, uh, the board of directors meets towards the end of the month, and uh, the audited statement of accounts should be considered at the level of the board at its next meeting. And could, you advise, and, could, and could you advise us, as you're on that point, when would the 2017 um, financial report be ready? Because you know, under the State Enterprises Performance Manual, three months at the close of the financial year, yes. your report is supposed to be submitted. Yeah, but I doubt we would be able to reach that target of three months because let me explain. We, the current external auditor will virtually have to retire, and I'm using <laughs> the retire on the conclusion of this current audit. Okay. Because this auditor has been with us for some considerable time, even before our time. And then we immediately, in fact, we are in the process now of distributing RFPs and inviting a number of auditing entities to respond. There's a process, basically there's a process. And uh, once that process is completed and we appoint, or at least we agree on the preferred candidate to conduct that exercise, then that has to be approved and adopted by a meeting of the company. So we have these little, and once that is done, 
then we could engage the services of the new auditor. And uh, for many reasons, one is that the auditing firm, whoever that may be, would be dealing with this entity for the first time, unlike the outgoing one, and um, then the engagement. So that we don't think we would be able to meet that deadline of three months thereafter. Um, so, yes, but it would be, I would think, certainly within the first six months of next year. And not because of us, because of the process that we need to go through. Thank you. Um, may I ask the Aegis Business Solutions mm -hmm. that we talked about in terms of 2014? Um, would you be able to provide this committee with a copy of that report, which cost us a million dollars? Apart from the Price Waterhouse Coopers, which, as you said, is um, critical reading and a must, what about the Aegis Business Solutions report, which cost us a million dollars in 2014? Do you have a copy of that report on your records? Yes, we do. Okay, well, could you supply us with a copy of that report? Okay. Yes, Mr. Chairman. And could you tell us the PWC re report, how long did it take to be generated? And secondly, how much did it cost the company to produce that report? I could tell you that we engaged them around the month of January of 2016. And they produced their report, the final report, by April of that year. Let me just give you, I think I have some details on that in terms of the cost. Uh, we have, we, I do have that here. Yes. Um, the cost for that, I can tell you, $398,953. And my final question before I ask Mr. Foster coming, Cummings rather to get in. Um, we know, Mr. Ben, or Mr. Chairman, that over the last few years, as Mr. Small said, Netco has been in deficit. Losses from 2008, and you have a break even position in 2014. Because my friend said everything seemed to be balancing in 2014. The, the, the question here is given your new team, and given the transition that you are in, when do you anticipate Netco would wean itself, as the Prime Minister would say, away from government subventions and be in a position to stand on its own two feet in terms of providing loans to the small and micro entrepreneurs at a reasonable rate of interest, and with your efficient and effective management team, have your loans recovered on a timely basis, and use that as a basis to generate more loans in the future. Could you share with us your vision for the self-sufficiency in quotations of Netco in the coming period. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I 
read it, can't say precisely what, but I will put it in a sort of context. Um, well, of course, this will be a critical part and component of the strategic plan with projections going forward. But I can say here now that a number of, of things got to be modified and restructured and so on. One of which is, as you say, the total dependence on the state for financing. And not only loan, well, to some extent loan, loan financing, but even to meet admin costs. We want to really reduce that reliance over time. But we will not be able to do it by ourselves. And I'll tell you what I'm thinking. For instance, we got to recognize that this is a state enterprise. We would need an increase quantum of loan financing. We cannot now get there without the support, first of the line ministry, and of course the Ministry of Finance. For instance, I will just share this with you, although we haven't formalized this approach. It would mean that we will have to enter the domestic marketplace to generate loan funding. The state of affairs of the of NEDCO's accounts, nobody will listen to us. In other words, if we take our balance sheet and try to peddle and try to encourage anybody to lend us money, it will not happen. So we have to clean that balance sheet. It must be cleansed. And there's precedent for that in the domestic financial services sector of how that can be done. So we are hoping that this is one of the hurdles we'll have to cross in our interface with our line ministry and the Ministry of Finance in terms of the way forward. Um, because initially, we believe that if we can have this balance sheet cleansed and uh, the non-performing segment of the portfolio is hived off and dealt with separately off balance sheet, as you would say, and you have a new kind of reporting for NEDCO, which is showing, acknowledging, yes, that you have some bad debts which are located elsewhere, but that you really mean business starting now. We would need, perhaps, a government guarantee as we go out to the marketplace and attempt to raise, raise um, resources. And once, once we can clear these hurdles, the sky is the limit, Mr. Chairman. Once we can clear these hurdles in terms of our ability to access loan financing, the sky would be the limit. Clearly, the name NEDCO has to be rebranded, and I think, Mr. <laughs> yes, <laughs> has to be rebranded, must. We cannot go same old, same old, and hope that anybody will listen to us. Chairman, and like my colleague, Senator Small, I have a few questions. I'll try to save some maybe for the next occasion. Mr. Chairman, you mentioned earlier that based on the situation with the auditors, and you did give us a lot of information about the move by NEDCO to recruit new auditors, et cetera. Will NEDCO 
be officially informing the Ministry of Finance of its inability to meet the requirements of the performance manual of the state enterprises. In fact, I, even before we get to the Ministry of Finance, we have to advise the line ministry. Yes. Moving on. I've listened to the situation surrounding the non-performing loans. And um, of course, that is an area of concern. But let me ask, does NEDCO over its history have any success stories to share with the public in relation to what um, NEDCO's core function is? Yes, we do. Several. And pro probably you want to hear some of them? Or at least one. No. <laughs> um, I'll ask the, who will do it? You, um, all right. I'll ask me somebody else to deal with that. Thank you, Member. We've had a number of success stories, but I don't think time will um, permit one. us to go through all of them. Uh, right? So for example, uh, one of our clients, uh, Vida Gobin, who's famous for what we call mother-in-law foods, she started off on a small scale, and now she's a producer of award-winning pepper sauces. She exports, and she has grown from a home operation to a large facility where she now employs about 10 persons, right? So her products recently entered the North American market. She has a product known as the Fire Sauce, which actually won the best pepper sauce in the Caribbean category in the World Food Championship in Las Vegas. That was in 2015. So we do have clients who are shining stars who have moved from what we call the small, even the micro operator, to become larger in terms of their scope, in terms of their operation, and entry into the um, foreign markets. And they have been earning currency for us, which is extremely valuable. And we are trying to get more of our clients to export their products and giving them the necessary support to do so. Before I move from you, Mr. Mayors, if you had to put in a paragraph what the service, what is the service offered by NEDCO to the public? How would you describe that to us? We are a caring institution that deeply diagnoses each client that comes to us. We do a comprehensive diagnostic on any applicant which identifies their needs. It looks at the industry, it looks at the strengths, it looks at the type of support they need to be successful and to operate a sustainable business to employ or create employment for other individuals and to contribute to the country's GDP. So it's not just about granting the loan to the entrepreneur. You, you have a range of services that would support their efforts. That is correct. We are in the business of relationship building. Uh, it is not just a question of a client appearing before us, presenting a business plan, and getting funding and repay the debt. We establish that relationship, and there's continued support throughout the term of the loan, and even after repayment, we encourage them to come back to us. If you need additional funds, if you need to expand your business, and we, we have seen that some of those clients have now become advocates for the company. Let me ask, in terms of the delinquent account, I know that you mentioned, Chairman, that there is a, an external agency doing collections. What is the policy of NEDCO in relation to some of these aged accounts? I mean, as best as you can answer without giving anybody a, an, an exit not to pay. But I'm just, I'm just curious as to how are you going to approach these aged accounts? All right, just as we, on the positive side, we mentioned that there is that relationship we established with our clients. We keep the contact with the delinquent clients. Now, a few of them have absconded. We, they've just disappeared into the woodwork. But we are relentless in our pursuit of such clients. Um, whatever security instruments we have, we try to encash them. And now that we have a collection agency, there's that reputational risk that clients wish to avoid. 
So by going behind them and having their information published through those debt reach, the credit bureaus, et cetera, they are now forced to repay the debt, where either through embarrassment or through their inability to obtain credit elsewhere. So that we are relentless, we never give up, albeit the task is sometimes difficult, particularly for those loans that have aged over the years. Okay, and I'll round off. Don't want to dominate the question session. To the Ministry of Finance Investment Division. What is the relationship between NEDCO and the Investment Division in terms of monitoring and support and evaluation of NEDCO's performance? Good morning again. Okay, the Ministry of Finance Investments Division, who, who I'm a, a, a staff member, we continue with our monitoring and evaluation of NEDCO as well as all the other state enterprises. But specifically for NEDCO, um, presently we, we observe or we uh, recognize that NEDCO is in transition having a new board appointed recently, and we also recognize that the board is operating within a, a new mandate, but we continue with our monitoring of the enterprise mm -hmm. in general, and that we ensure that NEDCO um, comply with the compliant requirements as outlined in the manual. I, to date, I don't think we have any any serious issues with NEDCO and, it, and its, its compliance. Uh, we recognize that there are um, one or two financial statements that are, are being prepared, um, and we, we take note of what the chairman has said with respect to the financials and the, the, the transition of the auditor. We take note of that and that we will continue liaison with the company to ensure that the company is carrying out its compliance requirements. <coughs> yes, obviously, uh, within the compliance, there's always the um, requirements of the board to submit minutes of its meeting to the to the to the investment division for the information of the minister that is part of the compliance requirements as well as any other items that are stated in its compliance requirements we follow up on those with the with the company assist other state agencies involved in similar type businesses? What I can say is that um, from a, a monitoring and evaluation perspective, if any enterprise wishes to engage in any initiative that may help expand the, the growth of the, the, the unit or to um, make any in diversion from its mandate, it's always, it's always important that the, the, the enterprise liaise with the ministry, seeing that we are the monitoring agency. So if NEDCO decides to have a, some kind of initiative with another lending agency, especially from a financing or a funding perspective, we will expect that NEDCO will liaise with the minister Cooperation soul in that regard. Okay, not quite.
clarify the um, response to the question I was asking, but um, let me just, what I'm asking is, if you have a state agency that has proven to be successful in its operations, involving similar type business, from the investment division point of view, would those learnings from that agency be used or shared with another state agency doing similar type business to assist that agency in getting to where an agency like TTMF is at this point? Well, I think obviously any any good learning experience or any one state enterprise that could be developed into a model for other state enterprise, other state enterprises in the operation, we will always look at it and 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 advocate for, for the for whether it's it's a, a, a model to be adopted. I mean, the, the, the Minister of Finance will will review it, and if it's a model he thinks that other enterprises should adopt, I think that that will be done. And I, and I want to thank my colleague, Senator Cummings, for going down a, a particular path. I, I think that I empathize with the, the team from Ministry of Finance because I think we all understand the investment division is, under, is under-resourced. And I have a particular issue. I think that the investment division operates in too much of a post facto mode. And I think that there needs to be engagement with, with state entities on an on a on, ongoing basis. So like, for instance, at the beginning of a, a financial cycle, where is the operational plans for the year? I think that the investment division should be involved in a discussion with all of those entities. Let's have a quick review of your plans for the year going forward so that there's no surprise or shocks. Because what the, the, the reality is, time the board takes a decision and then it's confirmed and then the, the document actually lands in the investment division. Three months have passed. So it, it's, it's, it's a done deal. And that is something that I, I could continue to advocate for, Mr. Chairman. I would like to address my next question to Madam Permanent Secretary, Minister of Labor. Welcome again, Madam Permanent Secretary. You look very happy this morning. <laughs> Mr. Ben has taken the, 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 the brunt. <laughs> but Madam Permanent Secretary, how would you describe the relationship between the ministry and NETCO? Because I know the ministry has, is, is a, is a people-centered, people-focused entity. And we are trying to, you have many programs going on, like Fair Share and, and IBIS, I'm well aware, I'm well up to date with the activities. But how is the relationship with, with NETCO when you sit as the, the line agency and you see a struggling, floundering agency in your portfolio? How, how, how do you help manage that? How do you help this agency? What do you do? I need to understand what is happening there because on the basis of the numbers and the data we have in front of us, it seems to be just completely going off the rails. And I would like to understand what is the line agency doing or has done or is planning to do? Thank you, Member. Um, the Ministry recognizes the challenges that the NEDGO has faced and has sought to um, meet regularly with the company to address those challenges. Um, we would have communicated, we would have held meetings, and we continuously seek to support NEDCO and to arrive at solutions to address these challenges. I think that the, the other area I want to go down, Madam Permanent Secretary, given the, the, the straightened circumstances of, 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 our, of our economy now, and I understand that all ministries are looking very hard at expenditure. Has that message been, how does, it mean, how, how does that work? Is it that these entities are out on their own and they get a general message, or do they get very clear directives from the ministry? Hey, the government has Im, 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 impacted, imparted and forced ministries to have certain levels of cuts across the board. We would expect that you would look very hard and be very pretty. How How is that message transmitted? Or is it transmitted at all? In light of recent circumstances, that message would have been communicated to the various um, agencies that fall under the ministry. And we would have advised them to look carefully at their finances and in terms of the programs they wish to implement going forward. In terms of discretionary expenditure, 
where you, I, you look at uh, the, the, the spending of, of NETCO on a whole, our whole sheets, there's a lot of discretionary expenditure in there. Does the ministry really, does the ministry in any way look and say, listen, we've looked at your last accounts and you're spending some money in some areas here that perhaps you really need, we, while the ministry may not direct, I, I think the ministry could point out and say, perhaps you, know, you could spend this money in a more prudent way, given the fact that you're hemorrhaging money. I think that the, 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 the issue for me is that the, the entity is hemorrhaging money and there should be a minute focus on making sure and understanding that it is taxpayers' dollars that is funding your, the activities of the entity. That has to be driven through the system. And I, and I looking at here, I, I, I am not sure if, if that is, is really right in front of them. Certainly, Madam Permanent Secretary, I don't want to put you on the spot. Would, would you want to put these things in writing? Yes, I, 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 I suspect, Madam Permanent Secretary. I, I think they better put it in writing. I, 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 will, I will not press you on that, no, but we'd like a response because here is the driver from, from me. I believe that it is, it is in, in my, the chairman and my experience, entities who are in charge of state funds don't seem to get a message or don't fully understand that this money belongs to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. You are a trustee of those funds and you are required to be very prudent in terms of how you expend those funds. And, and I think that that is something that, and it's not always what you do, but sometimes how you do it. So Madam Permanent Secretary, did the Ministry of Labor have a, a, a staff, a end of year staff function last year? Permit me to ask because I oh, recent, you, you. I well, recently joined me. the ministry, so I have to well, inquire. Forgive me, I, I, I withdraw. Would, would, would you be surprised to hear that Netco had a, a, star, a NVS staff function at a, at a, at a Fort Spain hotel? Yes, I would be. You'd be surprised to hear that? Yes. Well, it's on their website. You can see all the pictures from it. And those are things that, and I'm not saying, I'm not against the staff having, but we have to understand the circumstances of Trinidad and Tobago. So when you go to Netco's website and you open it, there's pictures of everybody having a good time at a Fort Spain hotel at the NVS function in a situation where the entity is generating no revenue. It's hemorrhaging money. Somewhere inside of there, the, these people have to look at it and say, perhaps, perhaps, if we're spending taxpayers' dollars and we want to try to give something to the staff, we could do it in a different way. Yeah? And then you put it on a website with lots of pictures. I found it last night. I just found it interesting. And if the, the, the permanent secretary seems, uh, uh, <laughs> it's news to her, that's even more interesting. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if you permit me, and again, Mr. Chairman, I forgive me. Value for money, efficiency, prudence in spending taxpayers' dollars, and accountability are my drivers. That these are state entities, and the message has to be driven through that it is taxpayers' dollars. I have a question now, Mr. Chairman. I will move from partying and all these wonderful things to the audit function. I, I want to ask a question. Has the auditing function in the, in the recent past, or even further back, I understand the auditor has been here a while, found any instances where there's clear fraudulent practices being employed in terms of, because there's lots of allegations in, in terms of the operation of NETCO, people making false declarations, people taking the money and buying houses and cars, or, or, or other people being compliant and uh, allowing false documentation to be used, or in some instances, people pledging, pledging assets and then the assets don't belong to them. So has the, has the auditor in, in their role, in their function, been found any instances of this? Has, has, has anybody been held to account for this? Thank you. 
Honorable Member, um, I'll ask the internal auditor. Thank you very much, Member. Um, just as uh, some background information, the organization did have an audit auditor um, previously. Uh, that person for the from 2007 to 2012. Since then, um, there has been a sort of a vacant um, internal auditor role within the organization until I assumed office in September of 2015. Sort of just on the heels of the new board being appointed. Um, on joining the organization, I attempted to put measures in place within the internal audit department so that we could have greater monitoring and reporting on what findings we may or may not uncover. In looking at the history of the internal audit department, I did not note any reports which may have indicated fraudulent activity being uncovered or reported on. Um, also, even looking at the um, audit committee minutes in the past, we wouldn't have seen um, anything being said. Starting from 2015 with the inception of this board and the audit committee, we have put measures in place in terms of setting up our audit charter. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> we have an audit charter which dictates the powers of the internal audit department and the audit committee. We have put together our annual internal audit work plan every year since then, and we're in the process of developing our plan for 2018 as, as well. This plan, um, usually the internal auditor role, the internal auditor does not set out to find fraudulent activities. However, because it's a, a responsibility of management to decide, design their internal controls in such a way that such activity will be discovered in the normal operations. The internal auditor, though, is required to design audit programs that might highlight if such activity is occurring, and the internal auditor is supposed to be aware of the fraud red flags, let's say, right? Um, to be able to uncover or highlight these types of things. So as the internal auditor, we've set up our charter, our plan, We've put together a formal internal audit reporting structure in place. These reports go to the audit committee and then to the board. Reports are approved and then they are forwarded to the Ministry of Finance Investment Division as per the set and. So that process is now in place and these things are occurring. Mr. Chairman, if you permit, I just have a follow up. All right. Thank you very much for your response. Perhaps my frame, I may help with my frame. I served as the chairman of the audit committee on a state enterprise mm. for 10 years. So I understand very well how these things work. And we said to us, the, the chairman of NETCO has indicated to us, you have a, over a period of time a 70 plus percent challenge with, 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 with. has the internal audit function gone? I said, listen, let's take a sample of those, those accounts and see whether or not there was any fraudulent activity because 70 percent, so just a complete breakdown in the system. That is what it suggests to me. As somebody who's looking at a system, you have s such a high level of delinquency. It suggests that there's something endemically, systematically wrong with it. And that, in my mind, should, should at least have generated an internal audit query. Let's pull a sample and see whether or not there's some fraudulent activity going or some activity that we need to find out to put a, put a stop at. Has, has that ever been considered by the internal audit function? Thank you, Member. The internal audit function is, this is on the radar of our, of our committee and also the department. We have begun looking at the area by first performing compliance type audits at um, June, assessing the loan process to ensure that what is, a, what is going on in assessing loan and clients and what's documented on the file is in fact according to the policy of the organization. So that's the first step that we have taken, the audit department, in trying to understand where the problem may lie. Later on in 2018, I guess we, we plan to, just as you said, delve into the specifics of the loan and also the, the repayment pattern and that type of thing to understand really for a sample of, of persons 
what may be the real reasons behind the delinquency, the provisioning, and the reporting on the financial statements, and you know, how it's conveyed. Well, I, I, also, look, I look forward to that because yes. it, what you've, say, you've, you've helped me because this is where, where we have to go. Yes. Netco has a problem. The problem is inside of Netco. Yeah, because the people walk in the door and, and don't want to be delinquent at the beginning, but they walk in the door, and if Netco's systems are not in a way in which it can pick those things up, then we'll continue to run into problems forever. I have one more question, Mr. Chairman, if you permit me in this round. I, I, I want to ask the new CEO, Mr. Chow. I listen intently to your chairman. Chairman is saying, listen, we have to change Netco. I know that Netco has branches, 12 offices. You have 100 staff, 12 offices. It just doesn't seem, I want to know, in your current look, in terms of how you look at rationalizing the operations of Netco, you need a, it's clear you need a new systems architecture, and the, the, the chairman spoke to that. There's no question about it. You need a whole new architecture of systems to, to put more control on, on, on the operation. But have you, in your current plan, in terms of your looking, have you looked at we need to rationalize the operations of Netco? We're spending $5 million a year in rent for 12 offices. Do we need 12 buildings, 12 offices? We have 100 staff. And then the obvious issue inside of there, who's managing, who's guarding the guards? Because bad things could happen when you have satellite offices without supervision. Bad things happen. And it's not that people are bad. When systems are weak, bad things happen. That's just how it is. So I, I can't see how with 100 people, someone sitting in the head office can manage 12 offices. I don't see it being possible. So Mr. Mr. CEO, I would like to understand, what is your thinking, what is your plan regarding how Netco is currently structured and operating? Whether or not is it going to be you're going to try to tweak it or you're going to say, listen, we need to rationalize the operation, we need to centralize in probably three or four offices, whatever. What is your current thinking? Prior to my joining the team on Netco, the board had already looked at these issues. So what I'm going to say is not only my thinking. It is obvious to the board that we had too wide a spread, um, too wide a spread even before the budget, but too wide a spread even more now that the allocations have been reduced substantially. And therefore, consolidation is on the cards. It has taken place. Um, we have started. We announced the closure of one office already, um, and more offices were closed in San Grande. Um, this was an IBIS office, I think, sometime in 2017 as well. So closures have begun, and we are, as we get sometimes coming to the end of contracts, low, uh, rental contracts, we are actively considering whether we should continue. As just follow up, for, forgive me, Mr. Chairman. Closure of offices is one element of it. The, the other element of it, Mr. Mr. Shaw, is the issue of how we manage whatever we mean. If we mean it, four offices or five offices, whatever, we need to fix the way in which we manage in Netco now. Because if you come down to two offices, you still have an issue. So that, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand also. So I, I understand that the, I'm, I'm, I'm heartened to look. I look at it. I went online. I, I looked at the website, beautiful website, nice pictures. But 12 offices for 100 people doesn't make sense. Yes. It, it, yeah. I didn't even know how we got there, but I am not about looking back. I am yeah. about looking forward. The, the structures that I'm considering as we begin the plan is to create self-sufficiency in the remaining locations. That is, revenue, expenditure, services should reflect a balance. So what your loans are, what your net value added is, what your training component is in the various locations. And I'm saying locations, the location is not necessarily relevant. It's your catchment area. Right, so in, in what catchment area are you serving? And in that catchment area, can you, in the future, make a profit? 
and what products you would offer in that area to make a profit. And making a profit may be the wrong term, but giving value to the community, giving value to the economy, and not being an excessive burden on the state. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. May I ask, Mr. Chairman, what is the, just remind us, what is your allocation for 2018? $20 million. What was it last year? $24 million. Do you anticipate, um, given what you have said about the rationalization of offices, it would obviously follow that you may have to consider the rationalization of staff? One would logically look at that. I want to also ask Mr. Ben, what's the name of the collection agency? Sorry, Avi knows. Avi knows. Avi knows, right. Um, have we been able to determine thus far, given the inability to recover? Um, have we been writing off um, bad debts? Um, and could you tell us how much? Uh, the, yes, on occasions, um, there have been instances in certain years when bad debts were written off. You, you have the numbers at hand? Okay, we'll supply that in information by year. Now, obviously, um, I don't know what is the arrangement, the financial arrangement, AV. I don't know much about that agency. But given the size of the loan um, issued to uh, entrepreneur, and given the period of time that the loan has not been serviced, um, the candle might cost more than the funeral. I'm, I'm wondering to what extent, if you could explain to us, what is the range that you start and what's the highest you can go? In other words, if somebody approaches um, Netco, what is the minimum Netco is willing to provide in terms of a loan? And what is the maximum Netco would be willing to supply in the form of a loan, given the nature of the enterprise that the person is pursuing. Could you share with us what is the um, range of policy in that regard? The maximum is $500,000. And is that a minimum of that? The lowest, we don't have an official minimum. But I think, practice, the lowest that would tend to come to us would be for about $5,000. 5000 Yes. Minimum, right. I just want to go back to the Ministry of Labor and the Investment Division. Um, may I start with the Investment Division? Mr. Manzano, you made reference to taking, having regular, almost regular um, activities along with the, as it relates to NETCO, in your interaction, you haven't found any um, reason at this time, no serious issues have arisen because of the new board and what they are doing. I have no problem with that. But if you could share with us what has the investment division been doing as it relates to NETCO and effectively monitoring NETCO over the last few years, because we are examining the accounts for 2008 to 2014. And for every year, except with this magical balance, 
in 2014. This organization has been in the red, in deficit. The question that I'm really asking is, did, what did the investment division do to, 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 to meet and treat with NECO? And what relationship do you have with the Ministry of Labor as a line ministry? When a company is off track and has literally been derailed with all these losses, what is the role of the investments division in that kind of environment and that kind of scenario? I'm trying to clarify that. If you could help us. Thank you, Chair. Um, like everyone else, um, we seem to be in transition here because I myself joined the investments division at the end of 2015. And during that time to now, um, observing the operation of the state enterprises, and particularly with NEDCO, um, we have, the, the division has been um, looking at the, the operations of the enterprise. As I said earlier, we are ensuring that um, they, they comply with the requirements as stated under the manual. But specifically recently, we have started on two fronts to um, expand the, the, the staff of the investments division as um, Senator Small has alluded to. We try to get on more staff. And at the same time, we are trying to encourage the, the state enterprises, um, including NEDCO, to strengthen their, 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 their corporate governance practices. So we are, we are actually reaching out to the, the units and examining their, their, their practices with respect to the, 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 their corporate governance. We are liaising with the boards to ensure that these practices are, are up to, to, the, to the, the standards that we require. Now, as you stated, Mr. Chair, the, the, um, the accounts specifically with respect to NEDCO, as it's shown, of the, the, the state on which um, the, the enterprise has been operating, what I can say, and if I can talk for the division, is that um, over the years, I, I think, and I, um, the information that I've got is that the investments division have been, have been trying to work assiduously with the, the prior board, with the, the management, and even through the line ministry when the opportunity arrives to try to address some of these issues. Um, it's heartening, I mean, for me and the division to know that we, we have a, a, a board that is, uh, while having a new mandate, is really going to make a, a, a concerted effort to change the way Ned cooperates and to, to make the enterprise viable while making a, a, a meaningful contribution, not only to the sector itself, but to the economy. And, and, and I say that from, from, from my personal vantage that even joining the division, it has always been um, one of my, my, um, my mantras that we should always try to get value for money. Um, from especially the enterprises that deal with, with government funds and do, those enterprises that are actually into the market because we have different um, enterprises operating in different sectors. But for those who are actually getting government funding and operating in the market, um, we all, I am always advocating that we get value for money for the type of subventions that they are getting. Yeah, 
we, we, we will, I can um, put a, uh, some information prepared for the committee to see what the, the investments division has been doing over the period, actually liaising directly with the, the enterprise, what recommendations yeah, we have been making. Value for money is very critical, particularly in these straightened economic times and even prior. And I wanted to ask the permanent secretary or any member of that team, with all these losses being experienced by Netco during 2008 and 2014, could you tell us from your experience and your knowledge and from the records of the ministry, what kind of monitoring mechanisms were in place to really bring this state enterprise into line given all that was taking place during that period that we are reviewing? and what recommendations the ministry would have advanced during that period to straighten that particular entity is like a rogue element that net core. The amount of losses they would have experienced and, and because the government was just providing money to it, there doesn't appear to me to have been that rigorous kind of oversight that the Ministry of Labor is supposed to exercise. So could you share with us if I'm wrong on this matter? And at the same time, like the, like the Investments Division, could you provide this committee with the evidential material documentation to um, support whatever you are going to be advancing? Thank you, Chair. I will ask my manager, Enterprise Development Division, to respond to your question. Good morning again, Chairman and members. Um, when the, the Enterprise Development Division was initially established in 2002, and but after for, it only lasted for a couple of years and then it was dormant for a while, it was reestablished in late 2010, early 2011. And that is when we were able to provide much more effective oversight of NETCO. Um, one of the things I need to say up front is that in terms of the expenditure, we, have, we did have discussions with NETCO about the expenditure, particularly when two particular issues arose. One is when the, um, there was um, lower subventions, and the other time was when they were, they were the, the, their expenses were increased because the CPO provided terms and conditions for NETCO's staff. So we did have discussions with them and they were talking and, and there was discussion about reducing expenditure to maintain, at least maintain, if not reduce it. Um, one of the things that we sought to do is we recognized that NETCO, there was an operation, operating inefficiencies and we realized that that needed to be addressed. In addition to improving the financial, ma the, the management information system, including the financial management system, the human resource performance review system in particular, those three issues were what we tried to address. In terms of the operating efficiency, what we sought to do is, at the time the government was involved in, a, uh, the, in the 10th European Development Fund, the 10th EDF, which, in, which supported the micro, small, and medium enterprise sector. Part of that 10th EDF included technical assistance from the EU. So what we did is we sought to obtain a transformation consultant from the EU who came in in early 2013, I believe February 2013, and he stayed until November or December 2013. And during that period, he, well, he um, reviewed the, the entire NECO's operations and made recommendations in terms of what needed to be done to improve their operating efficiency. Um, at the same time, one of the recommendations that, were, that the ministry had sought to, to, to um, enforce, well, to, to suggest to NECO was the uh, hiring of an, a chief operating officer, which was done in July 2013. Those two things, those two events, the support, the, the recommendations of the, of the transformation consultant and the hiring of the chief operating officer um, resulted in significant improvement in the loan appraisal system 
and that resulted in, as the, as, as the chairman indicated earlier, some improvements in the quality of the loans that were being um, provided. Did that report you mentioned, the transformational consultant's report, was that report made available to the new board that was installed um, two years ago? It was, yes, it was in 2014. As a matter of fact, when I was talking to the, the CEO, this is the last week or this week, um, it, it, it did come up again, and I, and I um, shared a copy of it with him. Well, would you be kind enough to share a copy with us? Yes. You, 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 you are through or you? Well, the, the other thing that we sought to do is um, we also ensure that, we also sought to recommend that NETCO establishes a plan for self-sustainability. And that, was, that has always been our mantra from, from the very, from our inception. So we sought to ensure that at some point, as, as um, the member indicated earlier, NETCO would no longer be, you know, a ward of the state as it were. May I respectfully suggest that there should be some collaboration and cooperation and liaison between these entities because it seems like, you know, at times you get the impression that they, 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 they operate in silos. And maybe the Ministry of Finance Investments Division, along with the Ministry of Labor and NETCO, there should be some kind of activity that would bring these bodies together either on a quarterly basis, so that you know everybody will know what is taking place. Because at the end of the day, what we want is a more efficiently and effectively run organization. And therefore, the sharing of information is very critical in this context. So it's just a suggestion. My other area, before I ask um, Mr. Small to come in, has to do with procurement. Could you tell us whether you have a procurement policy, whether the procurement policy has been submitted as a so Mr. Clary Ben, um, whether that procurement policy has been submitted to the line ministry, and, and could the investment division indicate us whether that procurement policy has been reviewed and approved by the Ministry of Finance. So first of all, is there a procurement policy, a draft one, and if there is such a policy, whether that policy has been submitted to the Ministry, which is the line Ministry of Labor, for its approval, and also to the Ministry of Finance, through the Investment Division, for the Ministry of Finance's approval. Could you clarify for us? Yes, sir, I could say yes. All. Well, no, not to all the questions. I can say yes. The procurement policy document has been submitted to the line ministry and the Ministry of Finance as well. Yes. yes. And, and have, you, have, have you, you uh, have they approved it, sir? We are awaiting approval as we speak, yes. How long, how long was it um, submitted? About a year or so. A year? Yeah. Um, Permanent Secretary, listen, we are talking about the purchase of goods and services. And we know that procurement, according to the World Bank, the absence of proper procurement leads to all kinds of irregularities and leakages. So I, I am surprised to hear that a draft has been submitted to the line ministry one year ago and to the Ministry of Finance one year ago and no response. Could you explain to us why there has been no response? Just, just an update just before. Yes. My understanding is that the ministry has approved it. The Ministry of, of where? Labor. 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 And small enterprise. Right there. How long have, have they approved it? Do you have an update? Yes. Okay. I'll ask the corporate secretary. Yes, corporate sec. Perhaps I can help out our chairman here. Um, the board had approved 
uh, draft policy earlier in 2016. And uh, the, that draft went to the our line ministry shortly thereafter. Recommendations were made for amendments which were affected, affected, sorry, and that document in draft went to the Ministry of Finance right after that. I cannot say the exact date without the documentation in front of me, but yes, uh, we are awaiting feedback from the Ministry with respect to the status of that document. Um, investment Division, could you guide us on this matter? As to where is that? Chair, I am um, aware that the draft policy came to the Ministry of Finance, but um, I, I want to believe that given the fact that there is a new um, procurement legislation on, on the horizon and that there is a, a, a model template of a, a procurement policy to be distributed to all the state enterprises, there will be some kind of um, I want to believe some kind of nexus in trying to find out if this policy is in line with the new procurement legislation. Um, it's something I could look into, but I want to believe that that's where it's at, to find out if the template, which has to be adjusted by each state entity, will, will, be, will be in line with what NEDCO had proposed. Okay? So I want to believe that's where that exercise is. <clears throat> Whether the new draft that has been approved, is that draft in line with the new procurement legislation that is supposed to be effected and operationalized in the coming period. Because as Mr. M as Mr. Manzano said, the government, that is the government's policy, that is the new procurement law. So whatever policy is guiding state enterprises must be in line with government's policy. So I'm just asking you whether you can clarify this issue as it concerns that draft policy. Is that draft policy consistent with the new procurement legislation, or is it at variance with it? I think that is important. I would say generally yes, but the new procurement legislation clearly would require some structural modification, definitely. So for instance, the appointment of a procurement officer and things of that nature, um, which had not been anticipated, and the role, for instance, of the tenders committee. All these would be changes which will have to be incorporated as a result of the new legislation. So we are actively, we are actively looking at all those issues and we are prepared to make the necessary modifications to ensure that our draft procure, well, our policy, procurement policy is in alignment with the legislation. I respectfully suggest, therefore, that the NETCO liaises with the Ministry of Finance because the Ministry of Finance is ruling out that policy. And they, are, they, they, they have a template that talks about structure and talk about personnel that's supposed to fit that structure. And I would respectfully suggest that NETCO, with some degree of urgency, um, not only revisit and review, but certainly take steps to bring in line that new draft policy consistent with the new procurement legislation 
as outlined by the Minister of Finance, and the Ministry of Finance will be quite aware of the proposed structure as advanced by that ministry for all the ministries, all state entities and statutory bodies to follow. So I think it's important that you liaise with the Ministry of Finance as a matter of urgency, because your draft is at variance clearly, and you need to review it with some degree of urgency to bring it in line with the government's policy consistent with the new legislation. I now call on Ms. Um, my brother Small. Mr. Chairman, I would like to give way to Minister Coburn. She's Co Coburn. And then, uh, then, right. I, then I will continue right. after. Yes, Sherry and Coburn. Thank you very much, Member Small. In 2010 or 2011, thereabouts, NEDCO implemented a program, Youth Rise Project, that was intended to assist at-risk youths in challenged communities. Mr. Chairman, you are smiling. Could you give the committee an idea of the results of that program, how many youths benefited, how many communities, and the total that would have been expended? Well, I won't be able to give, because my understanding is that there was only one program. But I don't know. Uh, you can. I mean, that was a, an approach to us to manage funds from another ministry. Uh, we were not involved in the selection of the candidates or anything like that. The funds, were, I think it was roughly 157,000 or thereabouts, uh, which were disbursed in small loans. We had a mechanism to monitor the loans, administer it, and so forth. So that was the extent of our involvement. The ministry did not approach us for further support in that area. And finally, could you explain to me what is meant by V collateral and if that in any way impacts your arrangement in terms of loans being serviced and loans being repaid? Right. At our inception, we dealt with what we call the disenfranchised community. Individuals who would not normally have access to borrowings at the established commercial banks or credit unions. There were challenges with them um, even speaking beyond the door of the bank, some of them. To accommodate them, we sought to hold some of their assets through an instrument that had been um, designed to capture some sort of um, interest in those assets. In hindsight, recognize afterwards that those instruments were not really enforceable. So that is what we called weak collateral, but it was in an effort to accommodate those individuals who would not have access to the funding, and we wanted to have some measure of security, some measure of commitment to that individual to repay the debt. Now, there are a number of them who honor the commitment, whether or not that instrument was there, but there were individuals who, uh, for one reason or another, were intent on not repaying the debt, not honoring the obligations, and there were others who uh, unfortunately did not have the success that they wanted with their business. Despite all the support that we gave them, the business was just not successful. We were trying to make entrepreneurs of individuals who were not accustomed to operating businesses, but who had skills that we thought could translate into that sort of success story. I notice you are speaking in the past tense. So is it that we have this? You have discontinued utilizing this for that. For yes, we have. Oral? We have discontinued, and we now use legal instruments such as mortgage bill of sale, which would actually put a lien on the asset. In addition to which, the type of asset has changed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the opportunity to join in in this other round, another round of questions. I appreciate that. I, I actually read all the documentation, so you guys have to forgive me. Mr. Chairman, through you, I would like to request, Mr. Chairman, if NETCO could provide to this committee a schedule of all the defaulted or de delinquent loans over $100,000 for the past five years. I think that this, this committee needs to understand, I heard a number of 4,000, but I am, let's look at the bigger numbers. So through you, Mr. Chairman, with your approval. I would like to ask NETCO if they could please provide us with a schedule of defaulted delinquent loans 
And I want to also ask, could they tell us what is the, the value of all the loans that they've written off in the past five years, the loans that have been written off? You've said you've given up on, on, on collecting them. Not today, but you can provide that to us in writing. My, my next question, Mr. Chairman, has to do with, you, you wish to, it's just for information in writing. Sure, certainly, Mr. Chairman. Rather. Um, while we are prepared to make the information available, it is the client's name whether we can do that. Or whether you, it would be okay. I, I, we just want to know how many loans. How many loans? And like, like, no, no, no. Not, not I, I, don't, I don't think no, no. We're not difficult people, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I have a question now around the, your, what you describe as your suite of fee-based training products. And I, I want to understand how, how much does this generate now for, for, for Netco? Because I, I, I'm trying to understand two things. How much does this generate now? And how viable do you think is this going forward? Because training products and mentorship advisory, there's a gazillion companies out there, entities doing doing this, and does Netco really think it has a niche in here to provide a fee-based service to, to anyone wanting an advisory service? And given the performance of Netco, I'm not sure that it stands out as, a, as, as somebody who people would run to for advice. So, so I understand my logic. You, you, you talk about it, and I want to know if it's generating anything now, and then just stepping back. Netco's history performance is abysmal. So if I were to recommend somebody to who's looking for advisory services, Netco would not even make the list. So I, I want to get from your side how you view this part of the company's business. Okay, just before I allow Mr. Mess to give some more details on it, let me say that it is, we see it as essential. Training and the provision of programs to young and even existing entrepreneurs. We see that type of training as essential. Um, so much so that we saw it as being compulsory, a compulsory need for any successful loan applicant. So that, we, in other words, we saw it as a, an extension of the service that we are providing. Recently, we did make an effort to provide those services beyond the walls of Netco. And so we had been interfacing with other agencies so that we can actually tailor program to suit their specific needs. And that has had some success to some extent. We feel that that can be deepened. Um, but in terms of the history, um, Curtis, you can. All right, contrary to um, an opinion that we would express, Netco has not been a total failure. There are success stories. We noted some of them, uh, some bright lights that have been shining. The organization is certainly seen as credible. We do have relationships with international organizations as well. We have linkages with academia. So Netco is and its officers are taken very seriously within the sphere of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship development, and as a player in the market. We have had consistent demand for the business advisory services. And while we have been doing it um, gratis for several years, because of the demand and because of the need uh, to increase our level of income and reduce our dependency on the state, we thought going into the future that we can have it as a fee-based service. It is in that context that we um, have taken the approach to you know, charge a fee, a very small fee given who our target market is and the type of individuals who come to us for service. But we recognize that notwithstanding their meager means, they do have some, um, they do place value on what they receive from us and we think, and we know that they, they are willing to pay a fee for it if necessary. 
And I, I like your confidence. If nothing else. Uh, Chairman, if you permit me, I have a couple more easy questions. I, I, I have a question about business continuity planning for next year. We live in a, in a place where we've seen all sorts of things happening in, in, to our neighbors. And I want to ask, is Netco prepared in, in terms of your internal systems, how you manage? If something, something happens to one of your, your, your core systems, what plan do you have in place to, in terms of being able to, to restart your system or sustain your systems going forward in the event of some un, un, untoward activity taking place? Business continuity planning, because you have, you have, you're essentially giving out loans and you have all of your stuff. I, I'm not sure what you have in place. Do you have off-site storage for your, for your critical data? I'm not sure. Could you help us with that? <laughs> it's an easy Thank question. You. Thank you, Member. <laughs> we do have off-site backup of our systems. We, the chairman indicated that we're now getting a new integrated business system. While um, that will significantly improve our operations, the existing system has been serving us for several years not with the full functionality that we really want out of it, but it has nevertheless provided us with some value. The information storage and so is kept off-site as well, backed up on other servers, so that in the event of a disaster, that information can be retrieved. Okay, good, I appreciate that. Um, I, I, I have a question also regarding one of the, your responses to the submission I found mildly interesting. The question asked in the submission by was, with the current economic downturn, what measures have been implemented by Netco to minimize credit risk from clients requesting loans? Part of your response is that the assessment process is independent of the state of the economy. And that additionally, due to the short-term nature of our loans, economic factors do not play a significant role. I, 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 <laughs> Forgive me, we're in a situation where the economy, the effects on the economy impacts every system. Netco is suggesting here that the, your loan assessment process is independent of the state of the economy. I, <laughs> for me, there's a, a little gap, a disconnect, and this is your response, it's in writing. So you need somebody to help, and this, these are the things that bug me or, or, or trouble me. Because when we, we you look at the performance of Netco, there's clearly a problem with the way in which loans have been approved and the whole process of how you, how you rate loans and how you rate clients. And when your response in 2017 is that the assessment process is independent of the state of the economy, then I, I am not sure if that's a correct statement. I, I would like to hear that this is an error or, or, or it's been, it's been, the question was misinterpreted. I would like to hear that. Continue. Um, in fact, Mr. Uh, Honorable Member, we have been saying at NEDCO that this period in our economic life is perhaps the best time for an entity like NEDCO. Now, is either we believe in that or we just throw that out for consumption? But we really believe that at this stage in our life as an economy, you would see the need or you would see an entity like Netco coming to the fore in a way that is even more strident and even more successful than if the economy were doing well. Um, in fact, for the same reasons, the periods where the greatest delinquency would have been the period when the economy was doing fan fantastic. That is when, you know, oil was whatever price it was, and the economy was doing particularly well. So I think it is in that context, it is in that context that that statement would have been made. In other words, we as a lending agency, particularly the sector in which we are concentrating our efforts, we will, yes, we know what the env environment is. And we know what people will be saying about the environment. But we cannot 
as a lending agency, we will not ignore it. But we cannot factor it in into, say, a template for consideration in our assessment of potential clients. And I think that is what I think that, that statement is, is saying. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay, I can't add very much. Uh, thank you again, uh, Member, for that proven question. Uh, I can't add very much more to what the Chairman has said, but perhaps it could have been said a bit differently. But what we're essentially saying that we undertake a good, a thorough risk assessment. We look at the likelihood of any event happening. We look at uh, whether it's a high risk, a medium risk, or low risk, and the impact of that eventuality on the business. So having done that thorough assessment and the client now receives a passing grade, it would have taken into consideration adverse situations which none of us can perhaps predict, but we're looking at the possibility of it occurring. That is what the assessment does. And based on the performance within the past few years, we can see that the loan portfolio is reflecting the opposite of what they did in the past. I like your response here. I still don't agree with your wording because I will share with you that in, a, in another place, I'm in a governance, governance role at a, at a financial institution. And that, that statement is the exact opposite of what we're doing, that the state of the economy is critical to understand how we assess people. But that is just me. I, have, I, I, I do more than one thing. Forgive me, Mr. Chairman. I have one last question in this room. And it's an easy one. I, I want to address this the finance manager. Again, we only have up to 2014 accounts. So I looked at your, 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 your accounts payable and accruals, and you have a number in here. It sticks out because it's a large number. You have something called other payables. And for the past, with the two years inflected in your accounts, it's $13 million. I, I'm not sure what could be, for $13 million, be other payables when you have all the other key payables, green fund, business levy, those should be big numbers. You have other payables as $13, $13 million. What, 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 what makes up $13 million of other payables? Just quickly, just, you don't have to give me all the details. Okay. Honorable member. Yes, um, during these two periods, which both actually 2013 and 2014, um, it was the accruals for payment of a RESA salary for employees. That was the main contribution to the increase. I, could I ask for the, Mr. Trudy Chair, if we could just give us a, a breakdown of what those, the total of, of these other payables are so we could understand it? Just. And for what period? I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not, you know, d disputing your, your response. I'm just trying to understand. And if we could have some, some detail through you, the chair. And Mr. Chairman, I, I'm, I'm completing my question in this round. Yeah, um, just to follow up on Mr. Small's um, contribution, um, finance manager, if you could put that in writing for us, we'd appreciate it. I have three final areas I'd like to clarify, and my other colleagues will then advise what are the areas before we bring down the proceedings here. Mr. Chairman of NETCO, could you um, share with us what is NETCO's key revenue generating activity? Generating activities, loan interest. Loans? Yes. Could you tell us also how many applicants, in terms of numbers, you would have received to date, have in regard to your new approach mandate, and then you also have a reduction in your allocation? I will not have that information readily available at this time. 
Any specific period we are thinking about? Well, we we are dealing currently, with currently, or yeah, uh, currently. Okay, okay. Yeah. We can specify the periods and, you can write and the years. Right? Okay. Yes, we can do that. And also, do you have a written HR policy? Oh yes, we do. Yeah, and can you provide us with a copy? Sure. Okay. And would you share with us? what your experience has been with the lower level staff within the organization as it relates to your experience um, re recruitment do you do you think that for instance the recruitment process is robust or was sufficiently robust and rigorous or do you think that you had a situation of square pegs in wrong holes at the lower level. At the lower level. We're not talking about the senior management because you already addressed that, but at the lower levels well, of the organization. You did say that they are hardworking, but I just wanted to ask you from your own experience and maybe what price what those Coopers might have said in their findings. We may have instances of that, um, but unfortunately, I haven't had much of an interface with the lower level staff. Um, early in our life, we did meet as a board, meet with them at the various locations. And um, we encouraged their expression of views and so on. I didn't gather that, or even from our HR management um, department, I didn't gather much evidence of square pegs in wrong holes. I, uh, in, in instances when it, where it is brought to our attention, and probably I'll ask the, the head of the HR committee of the board to speak to that, because I know of a few instances where this would have come to you and you have dealt with it acutely. But I, I personally, and at the level of the board, we don't see that as a significant issue. There are exceptions, of course, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there, there have been um, significant problems at the lower level, although there is always room for improvement as we engage the organization in, in upgrades, there are challenges, and our human resource department seek to uh, supply the necessary training. Um, other than that, uh, we, we have the full support of staff and they do try their best. Uh, I have a, a follow up on the chairman's question. In the data supplied, Netco has 100 staff, 12 offices. They are doing about 400 loans a year. I mean, uh, eight, eight loans a week in 12 offices. You know, we, we really, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult, but we have to lay the numbers on the table for us to understand what we're doing here. If you're doing averaging eight loans a week, you certainly need I, 12 offices and 100 staff to process eight loans a week seems to be something that requires attention. And, and, and the, my, my challenge is, is that this is not a new number. This has been going on ever since. So that when we look at Netco, and I'm not sure about the part of it about monitoring the previous loans, but it may suggest that some people may not have much to do. If you're processing eight loans a week on average at 400 loans a year. So I, I, I am trying to understand in terms of how you are looking at the business and the, the way in which the business is currently structured, how much really dislocation or relocation or adjustment or rationalization is required? Because we, we have to look at the numbers very hard. It's business as usual, as we've known it, is not sustainable. I think everyone in this room can accept that. Business as usual, as it's been going on, is, is out of the window. Let's try to, in the way in which we're trying to structure the, the entity to survive and provide the service that I think, I believe that the service provide is important. I support it. 
but it has to be efficient. And, and right now, the efficiency is, is not where it's at. So I, I, I do, I'm not knocking Mr. Mayors. I know there are success stories. But I, our focus as a public accounts and enterprises committee is on the dollars and linking dollars to efficiency. And how the business is currently structured with the volume of work, and I think volume is a generous term, at 400, 400 loan process, 400 loans process on average. Some years, 300. I think one year was 204 loans for the whole year. That seems to be a, a, a business that someone needs to look at it and say, listen, I'm the chairman of the board of this enterprise. How this is currently structured, you make a recommendation to the line ministry and allow the line, the line ministry to decide what they will do with it. So I, I think we, and I want to say this, I appreciate the frankness of the, the, the chairman and the members of the NETCO about laying out on the table. We, we've had different experiences in the past, but I think NETCO, if it is to survive, requires a radical adjustment, radical adjustment. And I'm not knocking the people at NETCO, I'm simply stating from the point of view of the fact that every dollar that come, goes into NETCO comes from the state resources, from taxpayers' money. We have to try to be efficient with taxpayers' money, as little as it may be. So could you help me with your thinking on this? Because I, I've listened, but those are some of the things that keep continuing to trouble me. Honorable member, you are saying the same things that I say. <laughs> <laughs> so I have nothing to add <laughs> to it. Um, I think that we are coming to the end of our inquiry on this particular institution. And um, I would like to ask the chairman if there are no other members who would like to raise any issues. If you can, um, in closing, in making some closing remarks, if you can probably, again, provide us with a summary of your thoughts and the organization's thoughts as it relates to getting it into a state or level of greater efficiency, efficacy, and economy, mindful always that your mandate is to deliver loans to clients in the small and micro business sector so that you could have some flourishing and development of economic activity that is so desperately needed um, at this level, both in terms of startups and those that are there to give, to give them the inspiration and the support to continue to expand and grow and develop. So would you want to share with us a few closing remarks as to the way forward? Um, and you can also take the opportunity at maybe a couple of days from now to submit to us in writing recommendations for the improvement of this organization as we seek to make it more efficient and more effective to serve the clients and the people that, is, that it is mandated to serve. So the floor is yours to deal with a tight summary, and I would like you to also submit to us in writing your recommendations on the way forward as we seek as a committee to improve the overall efficacy and efficiency of this very important institution called NETCO. Thank you again very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, I can say to you, well, I don't know what your time frame is likely to be, but I can undertake and promise to you that much of what we have discussed today and much of what you have said would be embodied in our strategic plan. I mean, that might be a little way off, but with a little patience, if you don't mind, the strategic plan 
will outline in considerable detail, basing all the projections in keeping with our new mandate. Um, timelines will be given. And I'm just reminding the staff as well that this document would be a critical document going forward. Uh, so, I will want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, on behalf of the NEDCO team, and to express our appreciation to you as Chairman and the other members as well for their frankness and their outright discussion of the issues confronting NEDCO. I could tell you that as we were planning for this <laughs> session. We want to show what kind of reception we would have gotten. And when I inquired of the members who would comprise this committee, and they say the committee is headed by your good self, I became even more unsure, more unsure than I had been initially. But nonetheless, I think we would have spent some time uh, exchanging views, ideas, and information, which I think would have benefited both sides. I could tell you that on behalf of the members of our team, we are heartened by what we hear much of what is being said here was underscored there, and much of what was said there was underscored here as well. Give us a little time. We will provide you with the wherewithal to enable you to examine us and to review our performance a year hence. And uh, well, then you'll come with the full battery of everything and we will hold responsibility for that time, time period, unlike now. Whereas, yes, we are aware, yes, we know, but we cannot really speak to that period. But we would be here, we would have been in office for some time, and you would be in a position to quiz us at length on what we have been able or would have been able to accomplish during our stewardship. So, Mr. Chairman, I believe we have benefited immensely from this session. The outstanding matters that have been requested will be provided to the Parliamentary Secretariat as early as possible. We hope that the information provided will assist you in the performance of your duties. And we stand ready at any time to provide any additional information you may require in your pursuit of executing your responsibilities through this committee. So we really want to thank you. Yeah, well, um, in closing, yeah, um, in closing, may I, on behalf of our colleagues here, um, thank you and your team. May I also thank our colleagues from the Investment Division of the Ministry of Finance for being here with us. Also, we'd like to thank the officials out of the Ministry of Labor and Small and Micro, Micro Enterprise Development as well as your team from NETCO. We too look forward to receiving, as you said, maybe by the end of the first quarter of 2018, your strategic plan, which would be completed by then. I want to give you the assurance that, and I emphasize it when I made my opening remarks, that these committees of parliament and including ours are here to help. We are here to help. 
but we have a responsibility, as you know, to ensure that the monies that have been voted by the parliament to any state entity is spent in accordance with the goals, the programs, and projects that the parliament would have approved. And therefore, the philosophy that we are always concerned about and we focus on is ensuring that these entities, apart from delivering quality goods and services, they do it in a very efficient, effective, and economical manner where we get value for our monies at the end of the process. So we are on the same page in terms of ensuring at the end of the process the quality of life and the standard of living of the people of TNT you know, would be improved as a result of our collective efforts. So again, um, I'd like to record our appreciation and we look forward to to you um, having access, you ultimately to a report, which we will table in the parliament. Um, the parliament, as you know, Mr. Chairman, through its minister, would have 60 days within which to respond to our findings and our recommendations. And we too will have a small team that will be monitoring the implementation of those recommendations. So it would not just go a begging. We will be monitoring and um, effectively adapt our recommendations. So we want to thank you and wish you a very safe journey to your respective destinations. And this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much.